I started when I was 11, I started with the classical guitar, almost similar to this one, and I added pickups, and I put three pickups on myself. And um, I plugged it into my father's radio, which is two watts amplifier. So um, that was my first encounter to the electric guitar. Uh, I didn't practice that much. When I first got the guitar, when I was 11 years old, I never used to practice very much. And every time I went to guitar lessons, the guitar teacher said that you haven't been practicing. So that was a problem for about six months. Then afterwards, I started to practice more when he kind of found out that I wasn't practicing. I just kind of felt guilty. So until I started practicing, he wasn't going to teach me anymore. So um, there was one time I went to a music lesson and I hadn't practiced at all. We were, I was reading music and he stopped me and he says, have you practiced this week? And I said, uh, no. He said, well, go home and practice. <laughs> he wouldn't teach me anymore until I practiced. I did a lot of session work from the age of 16 to 19, 18. And I knew this one pro producer called Joe Meek. I used to do all his records. Uh, he wrote Telstar. I don't know if you know Telstar. He's a number one instrumental in the world. And uh, it was quite funny because I do about four sessions a day. So I was, for a 17 year old, I was making a lot of money from studio work. It's, it's a good way of, um, it's good to have that discipline in the studio. And um, I met a lot of people when I was doing those recordings. People like Tom Jones, people like that. And uh, it was, but then I stopped around about 19 and went on the road with the band, The Outlaws. And uh, that's what brought me up to the 19 years. Yes, that's right, not a wild rock and roll life, but we used to have this habit of, Whenever we went to a concert, on the way, we used to buy flower bags and split them open and throw these flower bags at people and then run away. <laughs> but unfortunately, we used to have in our van, it used to say the outlaws, and it used to say, call this number. So the police would always call that number and say, uh, you'd be throwing flower bags at people. So every time we would have a session, in the studio that the producer at the end of the session would say, there's a policeman here again to see you lot. Every time we did session, there's always a policeman. Because we like to play practical jokes. We had catapults, gooseberries, I don't know if you know what they are. And, uh, and the flower bags. So we got into a lot of trouble in those days. But no, it was uh, Chris Curtis. Chris Curtis asked me to join a band that he was putting together. So I flew over from Hamburg to London and um, they had John Lord in the band and that's when we met each other. And from there, we just uh, John and I put the band together. We got other members in and then we had to kick Chris Curtis out because he was a little bit strange. That's another story. Um, we both liked Vanilla Fudge, that band. We both liked Mountain. And uh, we, we had a little bit of Hendrix in there, and John was interested in playing with orchestras, which I didn't mind, which we did. I think we did two more plays. But then I said I didn't want to play with any more orchestras. I wanted to keep it rock and roll. That's when we put out Deep Purple and Rock. And I said, at the time, I said, if this doesn't make it, then we should maybe play with orchestras. But if it does, we should pursue the rock and roll. Playing with orchestras is kind of difficult sometimes because of the balance. The guitars are so loud, the violins are so quiet. Plus, uh, a lot of um, classical players have a, they're, they're kind of a little bit they're snobs in a way. Sometimes they don't like to play with rock and rolls, and they were kind of a little bit strange in that area. So the whole thing to me reeked of a novelty. It was a hype. It was a gimmick, of which I didn't want to do again. Yes, uh, Ian's uh, kind of a hard person to, um, to play with sometimes. He's like me, he's very, um, he can be very upfront. And uh, so we were like two bears, and uh, I, I didn't particularly like his way of life, and he didn't particularly like mine. So after about 1972, he would always lose his voice. I didn't think that was too professional, so I had a problem with that. 
And uh, with Roger, I don't think Roger really likes rock and roll anyway. But um, you'd have to ask them, I suppose, why they started drifting away. I had no idea. Uh, yes, uh, I remember Ian Pace saying to me, I have this singer, he had a tape of um, David Coverdale. And I listened to it and I thought he was very good, so we auditioned him. And then uh, he changed a bit. I remember David Coverdale coming for the audition. He was quite a big guy then, <laughs> with a big beard, glasses. And I thought maybe he's not a, like a rock and roll singer. So we had to change him. So he took his glasses off and shaved his beard and put him on a diet. <clears throat> Um, we had lots of political problems backstage, but um, when I did the show, I thought I wanted to do something extra special. So I said, oh, I know what I'll do, I'll blow up the amplifier. Look, it'll look good on television. And um, I told the roadie to put petrol over the, the amplifier, and then just to light it. I didn't tell the rest of the band. They didn't know what was going on. So he poured all the petrol over the amplifier, too much petrol. And then he lit it, and when it blew up, it went up so great that it knocked off Ian Pace's glasses, came off, and somebody was deafened for a day, and a few people fell down. <laughs> it was like a, a little bomb had gone off. We wanted it to go up, but not that much. And it went off too much because they put too much petrol on it. And um, with that, the police were trying to find me, to arrest me. But afterwards, I jumped into a helicopter and we got away. <laughs>